a world where nostalgia rages across the land, where everyone and their mother has a podcast, where there's still a movie trailer guy who says, in a world. Three friends revisit films, shows, and games that molded them as they search for answers to life, the universe, and everything in between. Settle in and join us for Screen Refresh. Welcome back to Screen Refresh, a show where we revisit films, shows, and games from our childhood to try to take another look at what we fell in love with. As always, I'm Tim, and I'm joined by the rest of the Screen Refresh crew, Nick and Dean. Hello there. That two-timing ho. Oh, you saw that line too. Yes. So, speaking of ho-ho-hos, uh, in time for December, or the, the Christmas season, or non-denominational holiday season, as soon as we cover something other than, I guess, Christmas-based, uh, we're going to be talking about I'll Be Home for Christmas this year uh, from 1998, the Jonathan Taylor Thomas vehicle that I guess was written for someone much older, and then they decided that he's the it boy right now, and they decided to change the character to like a 17-year-old prep school student. Is that, that, was is that confirmed? <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. I mean, there are a few points in it where I'm like, why are, is he supposed to be in college? Yeah. It took yeah. me a second to realize it was boarding school or whatever. Yeah. So it was supposed to be college, you're saying. It probably was a college story. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. it's like they have lockers, but they have <laughs> dorms. <laughs> but <laughs> I was confused over the lockers and then he's knocking on a girl's door and there's, yeah, and I was like, I thought it was college, but then I was like, wait, there's lockers, and then it finally came together. It's, I don't know when they finally, like, it hits home, like, this is boarding school, not college. <laughs> yeah. But um, it does at some point. So the thing that's curious to me, and I'll be home for Christmas, so for those unawares, um, the whole movie is Jonathan Taylor Thomas is Jake, who's essentially the Zach Morris of um, the California prep school that he's at and his very own screech, which is this kid Ian. And he decides that he is going to go home for Christmas back to New York only because his father's bribing him with a Porsche. uh, If he gets there by Christmas Eve at 6 PM and he's trying to do that while also catching up with his girlfriend who he keeps letting down. So she decides to ride home with his rival Eddie after Eddie leaves him stranded out in the desert. So a lot of stuff to unpack with this movie, but I'm just curious of the fact that, so all three of them are from New York in the same like neighborhood and all three of them ended up street. All three of them (laughs) ended up in prep school in California. All their parents were friends. I guess. Hey man, that shovel you're using to dig, get a spoon or something a lot smaller. Cause I kind of had to throw out a lot of those deeper thoughts into it once I realized, is he in college? Is he in high school? I don't know. And then that's when I knew, like, all right, I can't. I thought that whole segment was weird. Whole segment? Yeah. Just the opening? You mean? Well, just the, yeah, because <laughs> it's like, where are they from? <laughs> I, 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 what the, I thought she was from, like, the Palisades or, like, just, like, 20, 30 minutes away. And then it's you find out, no, she she lives, like, down the street from him. I, what? Yeah. And then Eddie's going there, too. And it's like, so Eddie also lives in your neighborhood? Or is it like, no, Eddie lives in, like, Nebraska, and he just really wanted to get with Allie, so he was going to drive her all the way to New York, and then he was going to go back? Oh, right. Plus, Jessica Biel's reaction, like, oh, my God, is it snowing? She she looked like she'd never seen snow before, who someone from California, like Southern California, I can imagine, would have never seen snow. But she's from New York. She absolutely has seen snow. She's seen snow to the point where she doesn't want to see snow anymore. And that's why she went to California. <laughs> so I don't know. Have you, either of you guys. So this originally came out November 13th, 1998. Do oh, any of you June? guys. Re- <laughs> no, that would be convenient, though, for all the rest of this of like, we're going to drop Hocus Pocus in August or whatever it was. And <laughs> all these weird timings. Do you remember anything about this movie from like when it originally came out? Was this like on your in your peripheral? Did you? Dean, you're shaking your head. You'll have to shake louder for those uh, listening at home. I was just Dude, giving a pre-answer. When you, yeah, when you when you said we're doing this movie, that was the first time I'd heard of it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't say it's the first time I've heard of it, but it's the first time I remembered it, maybe. Or it's the first time I heard it. I don't know what I was going to say. 
Little column A, little <laughs> column B. I think I was aware of this. I didn't see this growing up initially until a couple years, like after it would have been my age group for it. But I think it was only because we watched a lot of Home Improvement at the time and Jonathan Taylor Thomas was like blowing up and they decided, oh, you're going to be doing voices and all these different things and you're going to be in like Wild America and you're going to be in Huck and Finn. You're going to be in this. And I remember like going to the mall uh, back home in Connecticut and they would just have like these posters on the wall and whatnot of like upcoming things. And it would just be wild America. I'll be home for Christmas. And it was just very Jonathan Taylor Thomas centric. He was a heart. Yeah. No, funny he a teen heartthrob. Yeah, he was, you know, actually all the other movies you mentioned him in, I have seen those a lot, but <laughs> this one is the only one where I really had no idea he was in it. Like watching this again now, I feel like Jonathan Taylor Thomas cut out this weird section of the late 90s that he was like this generation's Christian Slater of the kind of streetwise smart aleck younger kid. It was just Slater aged out. We have to get a new one. Jonathan Taylor Thomas. I feel they wrote it for Christian Slater, too, because I didn't know he had that had that title. (laughs) I guess I'm just not familiar with Christian Slater. Well, just thinking back, just he acts like him, kind of, you know, and a lot of the this movie doesn't seem like Jonathan Taylor Thomas. But honestly, dude, I don't remember him, period. I mean, I remember all those other movies he's been in. He was Simba, for God's sakes. But this was like 20 plus years ago. I mean, I haven't seen. Is he even still alive? Oh, yeah, he's yeah. definitely still alive. Yeah. Well, I mean, I well, feel he, like he once once 1999 hit that name has never been uttered since. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I you can't deny that. Wait, no. Now I'm just curious. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure he's around and all that. He's bigger than ever. Get ready for the Renaissance. Because <laughs> I think <laughs> it was in sync, and and Backstreet Boys came around, and that's where a lot of like the female attention swayed over to, and it <laughs> was less him. Boy bands just ate his lunch. <laughs> yeah, uh, pretty, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. That, I mean, the return of the boy bands. Yeah. How we were with Power Rangers is how the girls were with the boy band. So I I fully, I respect it. Yeah. So I I know this was kind of in line, less smarmy, but this was kind of in line with what his character was in Home Improvement of like the, the wise ass younger guy, which I guess kind of led into doing this. But that's where I got kind of the Christian Slater thing of like, uh, if you go back and watch stuff like pump up the volume or things like that of. Christian Slater, when he was around this age, it carries that same energy and acting for the most part. So this was released against Meet Joe Black with Brad Pitt. And I know what you did last summer with Brad Pitt. So it was a grab bag that weekend. I I (laughs) doubt the audiences were the same people, say, watching both. Well, also, this was the weekend after The Waterboy came out. Oh, that was a good weekend. And it was like the weekend before A Bug's Life, Enemy of the State, the Rugrats movie. So it was just a bunch of, just a shotgun blast of films in theaters during this time of just, somebody's going to be watching something uh, for three weekends during this. This was theatrical? Yeah. Damn, I thought this was like a decom. <laughs> so here's the thing. Um, a budget of $30 million, a box Ooh. office take of $12 million. Oh, I think that's all the travel. Thirty expenses. million, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's definitely the the on location shooting and the Porsche, and definitely the Porsche. Eh, picture cars. They they only needed that car for probably a day. No, they bought it, and then they had to, <laughs> they actually did the work on it to get into character. <laughs> rest- Gary Cole. It was a complete yeah. ground up restoration of the Porsche. They probably gave it to JTT as part of a signing bonus for the movie. <laughs> he's under contract but he's like no i need something a little more to sweeten the pot like fine we'll give you the porsche i bet they um that yeah they bought a beat up porsche and they had jtt and the oh what is the dad's name gary, uh, gary he's, cole gary cole they had them rebuild the car like before the movie to like solidify their relationship it was, yeah it like very over the course of two christmases yeah so they really got into the role of yes. like yeah so the parts where he calls him dad, that's not in the script. It's just he <laughs> slips because it's been like so long. So yeah, so the the director of this, Arlene Sanford, um, has done all the TV ever. I don't recognize a lot of movies necessarily, but it's just two to three episodes of every show that's been popular between like 1994 and like last week. Um, 
but the thing I find more interesting is there are three writers attributed to this film. Uh, Tom Nursel and Harris Goldberg both did Without a Paddle, um, and Harris Goldberg did Deuce Bigelow, and the third writer, Michael Allen, did Enter the Dragon and Flash Gordon. So <laughs> there, there was a War of the Worlds going on in this script, evidently. I didn't see those influences in the story. <laughs> You don't remember at the end of uh, the movie when he gets there and he has to fight Eddie throughout the pagoda leading up to meet his dad for Christmas? Yeah, at the, when he sneaks aboard the plane, he yells at the pilot, you know, dive! <laughs> well, he does He does ride a little, like, jet ski, a flying jet ski, I presume. Also, the, um, I don't know if any of the music sounded familiar to you guys, but it was John Debney who also did Hocus Pocus, so I guess he must have been on, like... The Walt Disney Retainer the for a couple years there, yeah. Um, but it made sense after I saw it, but it wasn't like recognizable enough that I was like, "This is the guy who did Hocus Pocus." But I think also none of that necessarily jumps out to that point anyway. Regardless, um, isn't Huck Finn um, Disney too? I believe so. Yeah, Tom and I think Huck. That might have yeah, been to the Tom and Huck then. movie. Yeah. Yeah, that one. Yeah, which looking at the cover for years, I always thought that was Omri Katz from um, Hocus Pocus and Erie, Indiana on the cover with Jonathan Taylor Thomas. And then I found out it's like Brad Renfro or something. Brad um, Renfro. Mm-hmm. I think he was in two movies. Bully and that one. <laughs> I mean, I think also he was in a um, bunch. He was in some movies with like Stephen Dorff. The Gate. Well, I mean, Stephen Dorff was, yes. <laughs> But yeah, I'm like, just doing word association. <laughs> this movie has a lot of like recognizable people, but nobody necessarily that I think is super mainstream popular. From scene to scene, I I had to go. That's that's is that Patrick Wilson? That's not Patrick that's, Wilson. <laughs> that's the coach from Major League. Um, <laughs> no, but so like Sean O'Brien who plays Max, he ends up being like a, a cop in this. Um, that as soon as you see him, you're like, oh hey, it's that guy. Uh, and I can't name one solid movie, but I know I've seen him pop up in like 40 of them. Um, <laughs> but for the most part, everybody's probably going to end up remembering other than JTT. Gary Cole plays Jake's dad. Um, you know, Gary Cole from a bunch of things. And um, a young Jessica Biel. I think this was pre-Seventh Heaven or probably around the time Seventh Heaven was just starting. Um, but she plays Allie, the girlfriend and love interest. Well before she plays her most popular role of uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the remake. Sir, you have not seen Stealth. I haven't seen Stealth. Pick it. Yeah. No. Also, you no. haven't seen Mission Impossible 3, <laughs> where Sean O'Brien plays a party goer. Oh. <laughs> Mission Impossible 3, the worst Mission Impossible. No, that's 2. No, that's 3. No, not, no. No. Three is so frustrating. I think I gave it like a two on Letterboxd. Three is good. The entire plot is driven just by being like, we caught him. Oh, we let him go. Oh, we caught him. Oh, we let him go. So many times that I was like, you know, I don't care what happens at the end of this for any of you. If you put two above three, I just know you're wrong. We were in the old apartment and I think we marathoned all of them and I don't, I don't remember what happens in any of it. No, but it's fun at the time. Uh, dear listeners, write in and just say, what. I don't care what your favorite Mission Impossible is. <laughs> just let me know if two is better than three. Listen, I mean, you, as you don't, you don't want to diss John Woo, but you know, you can't, not, not everything's a winner. I'm not saying two is good. I'm saying three is bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's just because you hate J.J. Abrams. Oh, I hate J.J. Abrams. I thought you both did. I, I'm indifferent. I can go either way. I think it's just make a good product and I'll be happy. Gotcha. Um, yeah. At your bachelor party, let's watch two and three and just see which one is worse. That's how you want to spend it, right? Let's use up that entire time on that. Um, <laughs> no, we, so, we should just petition Abrams to uh, make a Marvel movie. Then we'll get Tim on that bandwagon. Now, you see, I have a lot of ongoing things with Marvel these days, but that's... Hither nor thither. We'll do that on the next rule of thirds. Um, most um, heartbreaking fandoms that you just don't have the morale to continue supporting. So, beginning of this movie, they kick right in. Um, the whole thing with the, the, like, I miss the days of, like, a kooky animated intro. While this, like, Pixar dot and a Santa hat runs roughshod over this, like, entire map of the United States. And then it goes on for, like, six minutes. 
because I started having enough time that it started recognizing as like, this seems really long. And then it was, are all movies opening with an intro this long? And it's just, I've been blanking them out of my head for decades. No, it felt long. I was like, yeah, yeah. just kind of getting ready. To, I was opening notes and things on the computer and I was just like, is this still going on? <laughs> well, the thing that caught me off guard is there was like, no lead in it was just i clicked play i went to go like open up my google doc so i can start taking my notes and it just instantly music's going it's going right into the intro here's the credits and i was like oh so no lead in of like walt disney presents and all this other stuff and they go right in and it's like oh got a rush and then i finish i'm like okay i guess i didn't have a rush i still have like four minutes left they're still going through it's just the entire credits in the beginning for some reason so yeah, so we end up at the the school. So Jake, played by Jonathan Taylor Thomas, as I mentioned before, he's like this very Zach Morris character from Saved by the Bell, um, just because he seems to be the somehow the cool kid at school and the not cool kid at school because he still gets in like scuffles with the jocks and the other kids, but somehow he's always running schemes where he's making money and he's like bossing around he's other like Van kids. Van Wilder, did you say that? Sir? I did. Kinda, of, but Van Wilder was cooler though. Like, yeah, and I don't, I don't mean as a knock against JTT. It's just the way that he's portrayed in the movie. I'm like he gets screwed over with one test, like one t- cheated test thing, and he gets thrown into a locker kind of thing. Like Van Wilder wasn't accountable like that. I don't remember. I don't yeah, know. it's almost like if, well, if if his schemes didn't work, it was the end user's fault, not Van Wilder's fault. <laughs> Yeah, and it's just weird on how he was like the super cool guy and the biggest nerd at the same time, and it's like, pick one. Yeah, so he has this like henchman Ian that he uh, (laughs) breaks free of a locker, um, which immediately, that's why I was thinking like Zach Morris and Screech of, okay, so you're kind of the, the mouth of the operation, you're getting all these schemes in place, and then the other kid is the one actually like accessing computer systems and he's the one that's like doing all the other grunt work for i make him. the plans if the plan doesn't work i make a the, new plan you gotta love the 90s way of like i'm a computer hacker so i'm just gonna hack into every database possible because the script thinks i can do sort of things like that as long as you do it off screen where you don't actually have to show how or what you're doing uh, like at the one point when they talk about the, oh, yeah, like I bought you a ticket to come home. And then I found out from my travel agent that his like computer was accessed somehow. He says that the ticket I sent you was cashed in for two tickets to Cabo San Lucas. He says somebody sabotaged his computer file. What kind of a world are we living in? Is the convenience of technology worth the loss of our privacy? Who would do such a thing? Where will it end, Dad? So you mean to tell me that these kids at prep school just like hacked this travel agency <laughs> computer, accessed files, changed around monetary information? The FBI, I the FBI should be showing up at the school. <laughs> when did when did hackers come out? They might have been a little preoccupied in downtown New York. <laughs> Like to me, why is he running these scams on these jocks if clearly his buddy can just access and change financial information from computer networks? I don't think they need like 20 bucks a pop for giving test <laughs> answers when he can just create the Da Vinci virus and like skim off <laughs> pennies from an oil tycoon. I had a shipment of diamonds rerouted to my dorm room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for That's buyers. Actually- you know anybody? So when Ian is shaking the thing to make it snow, that's actually what it is. Asbestos? <laughs> he, cr- oh. <laughs> he crushed up all those diamonds from that shipment. So, yes. So this whole thing that the weird um, save by the bell situation they got going on. Also, I can't help but notice the the era of fashion during this time of Jonathan Taylor Thomas running around in like beige pants and open Tommy Bahama shirts. If that's just kind of the... I don't live in California, but Dean, is that just kind of your standard California attire? Yeah, that never went away. Have, that's that's oh, never they still changed. Still have frosted tips because that that was probably the big standout for me. Is that's how every also other never guy seemed to have them tubular. Am I the only one here to have died done anything like that to my hair? I did yeah, growing I did up. Frosted tips. I didn't frost tips, but I did like bleach some of my hair, like dirty looking M M&M and M kind of stuff. 
I was always worried that if I did anything to my hair, it would not return to the exact way it was. And at the time, I was like, <laughs> I like my hair. <laughs> Maybe if you burn your scalp, it irreparably damage your follicles. But... <laughs> yeah, Don't disagree anyway. with my alarmist childhood nature. <laughs> so yeah, so um, the whole thing with Jake, he ends up going to Allie and like bribing her security guard of this other girl with candy bars of some sort and then kicks her out of the room. So this way he can try to convince Allie to go away on this uh, vacation to Cabo instead of going home for Christmas. This is why I thought it was college, because to me, what kid who's like 17 years old or like 16 years old and in prep school (laughs) is getting two tickets during December to like go away to Cabo with his girlfriend? Yeah, solo with a girl. Like, yeah, that's... Yeah, like uh... who, who would get those tickets... Like, okay, granted, his screech ended up obtaining those for him, probably. But what hotel service would be like, okay, and we're checking you in, okay, and you are two children, here you go, here's your room. Credit card, (laughs) you got got it. (laughs) What I want to know is what are two 17-year-olds going to do in Cabo? Like, that's a party thing for spring break, sort of place i mean maybe they can that's like fake 18 i think 18 is the legal age in mexico so oh maybe but still it's just like let's go to vegas like none of us can gamble like why why would you want to go to vegas of all places if you can't gamble and just an extravagant vacation like that i would feel drinking isn't going to be the primary thing but it's going to be one hell of a supporting thing (laughs) to your whole trip you know So, yeah, I mean, I guess it worked out that she turned him down because she loves going home for Christmas. She wants to return to New York uh, with their winters and the sleigh bells and the carolers and is upset at him for trying to get her to uh, do anything. But so this is when we have Eddie, who's the going to be the ongoing rival throughout this, ends up meeting them in his car, driving backwards as he's taunting Jake and hitting on Allie. Until eventually he just crashes his car and then, I guess, off-screen repercussions because he next scene he has his car again and they're just ready to hit the road the next day. I think he stabbed the other driver so they wouldn't have to deal with insurance. Well, yeah, that's the thing. Like, if you're going to hit a car, you have to make sure they're dead. (laughs) They can't show up in court. Can't afford those premiums increasing. (laughs) This is not legal advice. (laughs) <laughs> it's just that stupid trope too where he's actively talking to somebody not paying attention to where he's going but it's worse because he's going backwards in his car and he's not and he's going kind of fast that whole yeah. time just waiting for him to hit somebody and sure enough such a different movie if he ends up hitting somebody and killing a pedestrian from there and then they slap the cuffs on Eddie his life is ruined Jake gets away scot free he never has to learn a lesson because he just flies back and gets his Porsche So yeah, so as we said, Jake has dirty dealings going on at this school because he's supposedly he had some issue with fake IDs with the jocks, the the Brant man and the Murph man and all these men that present themselves. But their whole issue is they sold him fake IDs. Fake IDs didn't work. They need some sort of repercussion to this. I never understood with fake IDs either that the kid always... It's like some, you know, super young looking white boy that doesn't know how to drive. And it's like the burliest black man as the picture, you know, like, (laughs) did you look at the ID for I wish they showed what the ID looked like because I have a really good feeling. That's exactly what it would have looked like. It's like, how old are you? Oh, you look pretty young for 45. (laughs) But yeah, like it's this on. I feel like back during the 90s, they weren't using at least to my knowledge, that like the scan process of they throw it through the machine or they like do the barcode scan thing on it. It was just, I look at a picture. Does the picture match who I'm looking at? Does it look kind of accurate? Great. Papers, how do they please. screw something up? So, yeah, exactly. Like how do they screw up something so simple time and time again? Um, so anybody who was alive during the 90s for the the club scene that used fake IDs, I would just be interested to know how that went. Just tell us a story as far as that. So he ends up telling the other guys, the Murph man, Brant man, all of them, that he's going to end up for a small fee, giving them beepers. And then on their next test, they're going to get them the answers um, to make up for what happened to them with the fake ID situation. That beepers thing made me laugh. 
That was probably the 90s thing out of the whole movie besides the frosted tips. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys ever have a beeper? Yeah, when I was on the football team, our coach wanted to constantly be in contact with us. So they would beeper us in class. <laughs> I always thought too. Beepers only notified you of a like, like an call this number. Call. Yeah, yeah, not like full on text messaging on a pager. I didn't know that could like, like one way text messaging. He too. is hacking. I guess I don't know. I don't know. I mean, he developed text message technology. <laughs> Man, years that before. Yeah, you don't see the B story as he goes on to become a billionaire. <laughs> a kid. Isn't he? Isn't he just the um? You know, Captain Crunch or whatever his name is from Hackers. Isn't that just how it ends up becoming? <laughs> he eventually seri- becomes he's serial Matthew killer. killer. He's actually yeah, just that's Captain it. Crunch. He's going to be Crash Override. I swear. Right now he's just zero cool. I want to write a scene into a movie someday where it's like, all right, I'm going to hack in. And then they're just like, they go to a shady website and try to download cracks and like they get software problems. <laughs> just like, <laughs> this is what real hacking is. <laughs> <laughs> Just smash cuts to them at Geek Squad dropping their PC off. Wait, guys, I'm getting doxxed. <laughs> so, yes, the so they set this plan in motion. Meanwhile, Jake talks to his dad, who talks about how, again, his travel agent alerted him that the ticket he bought for Jake to come home was accessed through their computer systems and like returned for money. And then two tickets were purchased to go to Cabo and all this other stuff, which... His dad is much less concerned and upset yeah. about this than I would expect. It's just kind of like, oh, you know, Jake, and then still bribes him to come home of, hey, even after you did that, if you come home, get here by Christmas Eve at six o'clock, I will give you the Porsche that we've been like repairing and putting together for years together. So <laughs> yeah, it's now like we have our goal. Jake is capable of a, a very nefarious actions. <laughs> Yeah. It's like he used it kind, you know, for a personal and very small gain, but we're like, uh, we need to correct this ship right now. Maybe that's why he's in California and not New York. It was a case of like, okay, uh Jake, we need to get you in a prep school far away um <laughs> before your hearing comes due. Uh, so <laughs> So yeah, so uh he ends up having this whole situation he gets his two tickets home to new york and he tries to make up to Allie, telling her that like hey i listened to you i heard you here's these two tickets we're going to go back to new york which he is back and forth in this movie as being absolutely like an insufferable selfish punk and then every so often he has kind of a a nice moment I know a lot of the the reviews like in hindsight a lot of the things i read modern day talking about this movie is looking at it as he's like a monster through and through the entire film. Rewatching it. I didn't feel that way. Yeah, rewatching it, I don't think he is. I think in the beginning he's a jerk, but I think it's like the last quarter, he actually like, it's he's fine. He's doing stuff unselfishly. Um, So I don't think that necessarily holds up as far as a today's lens on a 1998 film for John Fidelio Thomas. The last quarter, I feel he just grew a conscience. Yeah. And I would need a sequel for me to fully appreciate any kind of change because the way the ending, especially, I don't trust him still. And I still think he's a walking red flag. And Jessica Peel needs to run as fast as possible away from JTT for that whole time. But the, for as often as he was very just a jerk he had enough likable moments whereas i don't like this kid but i'm gonna continue watching to see where this goes yeah i don't think he was like completely irredeemable the entire time he wasn't he was doing things that was uh, untrustworthy and kind of shady um but i don't think at any point he was doing anything deeply malicious um for the most part at least uh, on his whole road trip thing. I think everything ended up for the better for a lot of those people he ended up getting in touch with. So yeah, so he is now on his mission to go back home for Christmas Eve. And as I said, he Jake and Ian give beepers out to the, the jocks. Um, the problem is he ends up taking the test, giving it to Ian, running Ian back to his prep dorm, 
where he's figuring out the answers and sending them over to uh, all of the jock men, the beeper um, whatever receivers. their crew is called. Jock yeah, the beeper men. receivers. <laughs> jock men. <laughs> so uh eddie because ian does not close his door after he walks in a room while he's doing illicit activities eddie just follows him back in there and then i guess grabs him stuffs him in a locker and then texts like game over to all the other guys uh so they're understandably upset which in afterwards when you find out that eddie is part of that crew and eddie is a friend of theirs he's like the leader of that pack <laughs> yeah. or whatever it's wait so eddie hung out all his own friends to dry <laughs> just to get at jake for this he had a sense of righteousness as well he's like i i don't want my friends getting by like this like they need to learn a lesson <laughs> I education's <doubt> important <laughs> i kidding. think he just really had it out for jtt and even though he knew how <laughs> malicious his friends were they were, he was willing to, like, you know what, fuck him. I just want to see him get screwed over from a a bad deal that he did. Like a sink the ship to kill the captain kind of deal? Um, yeah. Like, he likes the ship, but he hates the captain, so he doesn't care. Which, I figure it would be so easy if these guys are now coming after Jake, for Jake to just say, uh, we didn't do that. If Eddie is coming to us now, it's probably him. Especially since Ian is stuffed in a locker somewhere right now. Which they do a lot of things like that of, it's nighttime, if I recall. They stuff Ian in a locker. So that means Ian won't be found until the next day. And then later, when they knock out Jake and they drop him <laughs> in the desert, they leave a lot of people for dead in this film. Not like I was a just going to say, break. like... <laughs> They, they could have very easily been premeditated murder charges on these guys. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, like at least Ian is in or civilization. Or even attempted murder. <laughs> so yeah, this, this whole situation, Eddie ends up showing up at this party where Jake is at and brings the jocks in that end up telling Jake that they are none too pleased with the situation with the beepers. So in retaliation, he wakes up the next day in a desert, in a Santa suit, with a beard and hat, like spirit gummed or super glued onto his face where he can't take it off. Somehow they didn't think that there's any possibility of him dying. Um, I'm very curious as to how he wakes up during the daytime out in that desert. When it was nighttime before, did they drug him? Did they knock him out so hard that he just stayed unconscious for them to completely <laughs> redress him? Glue this to his face? <laughs> Put him in a van, drive him to the desert, walk him out in the desert, and then drop him off there. I feel like the blow they would have to land to his skull to get him to go out that long. <laughs> I, the, the same Jake ain't waking up. I think we, you might have discussed this a while ago, but it's almost like that's a trope that just has no basis in science. <laughs> it was on our because, Rule of Thirds trope episode. Yeah, like if you get knocked out. There's serious brain damage if you're not back up in a couple seconds. Like, you're knocked out you know for that what? long, like, you are fucked. <laughs> Maybe that is what made him kind of turn around as a person. <laughs> knock some sense. <laughs> if they didn't, literally knock yeah. some sense into that boy. You know, if they drugged him or roofied him or something to knock him out during that party instead of clobbering him over the head and still dumped him in the in the middle of the desert, maybe he still would have been a scumbag. I wanted Maybe. to see that entire sequence, though, of them. Every time he starts to stir, they, like, get him in the back of the head with another wrench and then just put him <laughs> back out. He's definitely not waking up after that. Jake wakes up in the desert, tilts his head to his side, and pours out half his brain so he can continue along. <laughs> oh, he's just all tuckered out. He's not dead. Life's much simpler now. I don't have to think <laughs> about things. So, yeah, so Jake wakes up in the <laughs> desert with the Santa suit. Uh, the Eddie and the jocks leave him for dead after knocking him out and this whole thing. Eddie convinces Allie to take a ride home with him instead, seeing as Jake uh, left her hanging there to dry, waiting for him. Jake gets to a gas station but can't get in touch with Allie, so he leaves this like cryptic message of Desert Santa Buzzer Tumbleweed. <sighs> this totally sucks. For the, the old read them all pick us up, I uh, kind of deal. <laughs> that's, that's, that, that was his girlfriend's activation words, and she just starts killing. <laughs> <laughs> He's been slowly the, uh, implanting it. 
<laughs> the little like Lion King Easter egg that they did too. Oh no. Because both he in this movie and in the Lion King, he plays Simba. He wakes up in the middle of a desert getting attacked by a vulture. I didn't. When did this come that. out? Ninety eight. I guess. I, I mean, guess. That was, those are years between any of the kids who watched Lion King were long since dead. Oh no, I'm just curious when they, Christmas came out. That could be possible. It's possible. Oh, you're just mad. I found a piece of trivia. You didn't know. I I doubt that two Walt Disney produced pictures would have a reference to each other. <laughs> Their Never. biggest hit of the year or of uh, the '90s at that point. That vulture is on the damn poster. It would have been like that snake eating itself thing where it's like Disney's got to sue itself for using its own copyrighted material. <laughs> Earl Burroughs. <laughs> its own lawyers are like, goddamn mouse. <laughs> oh, I'll be seeing you real soon. <laughs> so, yeah. So he ends up calling Allie. He can't get a call through. So he just leaves this like cryptic, really quick message. And he tries to call his dad. His dad doesn't believe him at all. And decides to just leave him stranded until he's found by a bunch of ladies, the Tom Tom girls, who are headed to Vegas to see Tom Jones. Uh, because who wouldn't in the 90s? And he lies to the lady to get a ride to Vegas. Uh, this way, at least he's partway there by saying that he had to work in the Santa suit and he's trying to get home to see his dad after the operation and all this other stuff. <laughs> the operation's on Christmas Eve. And now I won't be home until after the anesthesia wears off. <laughs> oh, dear. You know, me and the girls are driving to Vegas to see Tom Jones. We're Tom Tom girls. You want to ride with us? And thus begins the whole situation of him creating wildly elaborate scenarios um, just to get things out of people this entire trip. And... I feel like he really, it didn't need to be that elaborate. He could have just been like, somebody ended up like knocking me out and I drove <laughs> me out here. Uh, I'm just trying to get home. I don't live at this gas station. And that probably would have worked a little easier on them. Maybe he's concerned that he's too old and can't get by on like cute kid like power. He's like, oh, this guy, he could be like a serial killer. <laughs> Dressed in a like... Santa suit. <laughs> Just take off the hat and beard and get in the car. I can't do that, ma'am. <laughs> oh, okay. So, yeah, it's... I'm lost, mister. Can you give me a ride? <laughs> Wait, what's that from? I don't know. That's just him. That's his alternate <laughs> trying to tell the truth story. Just both hands out walking. To, which, actually, it's funny <laughs> that he can't tell the truth in this uh, movie. Seen as he was Pinocchio. Uh, what was it, like, a year before? Pinocchio. That's right. Pinocchio. Uh, so yeah, it's, which also, so he's in the car with them. They're driving to Vegas and as they're all there, he starts feeling sick and then he ends up getting sick in this woman's handbag, which I'm just wondering. So you've been unconscious for how long you wake up in the desert, you get in a car and you're feeling dizzy and nauseous. He may have had a concussion the entire first half of this film. It would not surprise me if they dealt serious head damage to this kid it's good he didn't go to sleep he does when he gets to the uh oh shit the, the sleigh <laughs> and actually yeah and that's when it bakes in because that's when the rest of the film he starts <laughs> kind of moving on the upswing so i think nick might be right so Ballsy. yeah <laughs> so uh so he ends up losing the beard when one of the women pulls it off of his face and asks did i hurt you santa <laughs> Good. We'll skip that. So Jake loses the beard, misses out on catching Allie before Eddie drives them away. Uh, so he ends up having to hitchhike with a reindeer on strike sign before ending up in the most green screened rain snow combo. Um, like he's about to enter Outworld. All of a sudden, it was just like this weird. Oh my God, did I look away and miss that shot? <laughs> yes, probably. I couldn't decide. It's like, are you entering Outworld or are you in an <laughs> Alice in Chains video? <laughs> I have to bring that back up and look at that shot. Please do. Because I saw it and I was like, oh, that rain looks weird against him. Like it's just happening in the background. And all of a sudden it's like, great. And now it's snowing. And I was like, oh, the snow looks weirder. <laughs> no, I noticed it the most when um, 
they were when Allie and the other guy were driving in the car. That's when I noticed the green screen really starting to stand oh, out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Any of the in-car scenes, because I think at one point it's like behind them, they change geography like twice during the car ride of like she's talking and it's like one area in the background. It cuts to him and then it cuts back to her and it's like fields. Then it cuts back to him and it cuts back to her and it's like mountains. And you're like, wait, where are they right now? <laughs> So, yes, it um, understandably for 1998, uh, with only a paltry $30 million budget, it was probably tough for Disney. Jake usurps Santa from his sleigh. He ends up finding it out in this town. Uh, He decides after a long sequence of talking to the Santa that is in this sleigh, uh, an inanimate Santa, he ends up pulling him and kicking him out of the sleigh so he can take it and go to sleep, which I would think. If I knew that I probably shouldn't be there and somebody might kick me out, I would probably sooner just like tuck in next to the Santa so it's a little less noticeable, but it works out because he doesn't get in trouble. He just gets kicked out the next day. Similarly, Eddie gets kicked out of the motel that they stop at uh, because Allison or Allie does not want him in there, which understandably so. Smart. Smart. Uh, She even has a bunch of rules for him of... If you say too many stupid things like that, I'll have to slug you. If you say anything nasty about Jake, I'll have to slug you. If you try to feel me up, I'll have to slug you. If you make me listen to any sexist, racist, or homophobic jokes, I'm (laughs) gonna have to slug you. And finally, I might just have to slug you from time to time simply because I find the prospect of driving across the country with you incredibly stressful. All right, sounds like a party to me. If he breathes... what? Great ground, slug him. <laughs> so when I heard her say sexist, racist, and homophobic, I was like, let me check the rating on this movie again. What? What is it? PG's also PG's in a is a weird world. I think, especially in the nineties, like where it's like I don't know some of those some things that come up. I'm like, I, I didn't think you could get this in here, but I guess that's why PG exists. It's not quite. Oh. Oh, raunchy we'll enough to, to be PG thirteen. We'll get to that later. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's which kudos to her for 1998 um being very staunchly uh anti homophobia anti racism which should just be the case but i guess it's glad that she announces it in this film for right. Eddie so yeah so jake returns to hitching he gets run over by a guy that's just trying to get his tomato um so this guy is eating a sandwich in his car Disgusting. drops his tomato yeah he's, this whole sequence of him like leaning, trying to grab the tomato. The van is swerving, almost runs him off the road before he ends up getting scattered down the hill, uh, losing a boot. And then he ends up having to swear a life debt to Jake because of the (laughs) potential death. (laughs) Oops. He's got a good heart. Yeah. Deep down, this guy. (laughs) This, yeah, this guy... I forgot how much of a character some of these people are until we get to parts like this. And I'm like, oh, this just feels very mid 90s family friendly comedy of just these like slightly off kilter, weird, like just non sequitur encounters that he has with all of these different people. I probably laughed the most at this guy's stuff, though. Personally. Oh. <laughs> So, yeah, so this guy, uh, Nolan, ends up uh, deciding, I'm going to take you along because I almost killed you. Um, We keep cutting back. So throughout the whole thing, we're cutting back to Eddie and Allie in his car um, and back to Jake's adventures from there. So Allie's just rocking out to like 90s club hits. um, And Eddie asks what Jake has that he doesn't. And she just says it's kind of a certain je ne sais quoi. She says like, oh, he mentions poetry to her and Eddie doesn't understand who E.E. Cummings is, and then Eddie ends up making a joke about poetry, and she kind of very begrudgingly um, is amused by it, which they slowly over time throughout this movie, I feel like, show the breakdown of Eddie and Allie getting closer, or at least more to an understanding of each other. Yeah. That you think like, oh, okay, so this is going to lead to eventually maybe it's like Eddie becoming a better person. Uh, no, at, spoilers for the end. Eddie will be locked away in jail and we will never see him again. <laughs> the, oh last, 
the last we see of Eddie is him banging on a police car, screaming for Jake to help him. Um, we, and then we, we don't just, know what he did, right? He just he pestered police. He's he's gonna spend the night and lock up if anything. Yeah, which means that if she just made it home for Christmas Eve, I don't think Eddie's gonna make it home for Christmas Eve. Um, he will be getting out of lockup if he's not killed, and then he's going to end up probably late. I was gonna jump. After. I won't jump ahead. I'll wait till we get to that scene later. No, you can jump ahead to whatever. Out of curiosity, I mapped his trip the best I could because watching it <laughs> I thought I knew the geography I US, love this and it's not as crazy as it sounds it's actually really anticlimactic because the only exception to this map is um, once he gets to Madison Wisconsin it's a flight to New York but aside from that that is the entirety of his trip and it starts with L.A. He gets driven up to California. I don't know where. They just said in the desert. So I kind of just picked where it's the... Um, Death Valley. Yeah, I just figured that. It's the closest thing to Vegas. That's where they're going. From Makes Vegas, sense. they go up to somewhere in Colorado. It was somewhere yeah, in they're Colorado. They're definitely in the Rockies. With at them. one point. When yeah. that guy hits him. They end up in yep, Nebraska go, at one point. Yep, North Platte, Nebraska. They specifically go to the town of Amana, Iowa for the the Edelbrook German thing. Like which Bavarian I, 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 Inn. I would have loved to go there. That looked awesome. I bet that... And then he goes... To, huh? I didn't say anything. I just said it. <laughs> well, yes, you did. Yeah, you did. You said I bet that. Like <laughs> I know. I just feel like I'm gonna interrupt. I don't want to interrupt because you're going to... Don't no. gaslight him. <laughs> And then they go to Madison, and that's where he takes the Santa Claus run in one of the neighboring towns or whatever, I don't know, within like a 20-minute radius of Madison, I guess, and that's where they he takes the flight over to, La- no, JFK, LaGuardia, one of those, I don't know. Larchmont, Larchmont is apparently like that section of New York before you actually hit the city, just after you hit Connecticut. Oh, yeah, because I noticed when he was... um taking like the train or the bus or whatever it is it said like now in new rochelle and i was like wait a second new rochelle you're gonna be in you're coming from like the connecticut side through so did he pass where he was going maybe i mean he showed up at jfk so he definitely should have come from the south going north but who knows i mean it is christmas might there might have been traffic and he detoured but i don't really i'm not gonna think heavy into it I mean, I'm just more surprised that there's actually a path for this of like, yeah, these are all real places. Um, I mean, I don't know about like the varying in kind of thing, but like the towns are real towns, just findable on a map. You should just take that like map poster and then just post it on the Instagram for listeners with no context of just like upcoming episode. Um, And then just see if anybody looks at it and would be like, what movie has somebody taking a path from California to Larchmont, New York? And then they'll listen to this episode. And I'm just hoping someone looks at it. <laughs> Much less. <laughs> what episode is this? Just look at it. Just <laughs> notice me, senpai. It is 31 hours of driving to go from Los Angeles to Madison, Wisconsin. So for him to be doing this in three days or less, he is cutting it close. Because, yeah, 31 hours is less than three days, but you're not going to be driving 24 hours straight. The last time, I, like, it's been so long since I've seen this movie, though I don't remember that last plane ride from Madison. So for some reason, I just remembered the Santa run and then him stealing the sleigh. And I was like, wait a second, does he run from Wisconsin back to New York? Like a Forrest Gump moment. So, yeah, like as we were saying, as far as uh, Ali and, is talking with Eddie, and then we end up getting introduced more to Nolan, who is riding around with Jake, taking him eastbound. Um, and at this point, Jake wants him to catch up to the, the Jeep or whatever the vehicle was that Eddie has because he notices it on the road. And he says that my girlfriend is in there or like we got to catch up to that car and nolan's like oh mrs claus is in there um <laughs> like that scene just <laughs> he was so genuinely like it was so childlike wonder mrs claus 
And then without even thinking twice, he bolts it after him. But of course, this is when like the cops always show up. Which I was a little caught off guard because I forgot his lines of like, Wait a minute. Uh, are you saying that's Mrs. Claus in that car with another guy? Mrs. Claus stepping out on Santa, letting some other guy down the chimney? Why, that two time and ho! Uh, no one reality check? Mm. You say no more, Santa. I'm after him. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> Man, PG 90s Disney just. You get one different. ho per PG film. <laughs> and this one gave you three. Merry <laughs> Christmas. Um, so, yeah, so. <laughs> Nolan doesn't do cops. Nolan has priors. So Nolan ends up trying to escape the police because the van's contents are stolen. Uh, so Jake decides he's going to lie to the cop and switch places and say that they're dropping off toys for the kids in the next town from there, which backfires. Wait, as wait. The- he says that? You see, officer, my elf Snowpuff and I are heading to the children's hospital in the next town. You mean Redcliffe? Yeah, Redcliffe. Exactly. To distribute toys to the youngsters. You know, I'm sorry if in my haste I sped up a bit, but every second counts to a bedridden child. Oh, I missed that. I had no idea what he was doing. And then when they were giving the toys and all, well, not toys, but when he was giving out all of the products at the orphanage, hospital, whatever, I'm looking at it like, is this guy boosting stuff like Fast and the Furious, TMNT1 kind (laughs) of style? What is he? Yeah, because he ends up asking Nolan, he's like, don't tell me all this stuff in the van is stolen. He's like, okay, I won't tell you. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what he was like. He convinced uh, Max, the cop. So then he decides he's going to give them a police escort to the hospital, which good for him to never catch on to the fact that when they get there, they get all the stuff out of this and into the children's hospital. And Jake has all of them sit on his lap, tell them what they want. And then he gives them a toaster or a hand vacuum. A VHS or- player. Yeah. Which, I mean, actually, in the 90s, a VHS player, I'd be like, actually, this is kind of useful. <laughs> now we can watch Lion King at home if Disney didn't put it back in the vault. I did like <laughs> seeing all of the different products. He had like an N64 in there. I saw Sidewinder um, PC. Yep, the joystick. Joysticks. <laughs> yep. And I was like, wow, I remember that. And we're sure that police officer is not Patrick Wilson. It is. <laughs> it is he looks so not. much alike. It's like they're it brothers. It is Sean Sean O'Brien. I know. I know. Yes. Um. Actually, wait. Was Sean O'Brien on the show My Brother's Keeper? Hold up. We're gonna I, pause I real quick. I don't know. Do Do we have to? <laughs> we do. This is gonna. This is how my brain oh, works. Boy. It's gonna drive me crazy. Yeah. So little Esteban ends up sitting on his lap and tells him that he doesn't want anything for Christmas. Um, he just wants to go home. He just wants to oh, see yeah. all of his family. And like everybody in the room is like breaking down over this. <laughs> it was funny. It was. And I, I really liked on how, what was his name? Nolan? Yeah. He openly admits on the phone with the cop right next to him, like, I'm not going to boost any more stuff anymore. And he's like in the <laughs> middle of tears. Yeah. So it's just like this funny sequence of it just smash cuts to like slow pan of, nolan talking to like his wife or girlfriend or whatever it is of he's not going to boost things anymore he's gonna go straight and then it's max on the line talking about how he wants to get back with his uh wife and like take him back and then it cuts to jake on the phone calling his family and just wanting to get home and it's it's funny also i was right brother's keeper 1998 to 1999 he finished this movie and then went back to filming that season we didn't question anything (laughs) We did. I, I questioned me. <laughs> oh. He ends up uh, talking to them. Nolan decides he's going to take off because he's no longer headed eastbound because he has a renewed f- decision that he's going to go back and try to get with uh, his girlfriend or wife or whatever it was and go back home. So instead, Max, the cop, decides he's going to talk to Jake about, hey, I want to get back with my wife. Uh, she'll turn me down, but if Santa asked her, I can probably definitely get some good faith there. So he needs to drive to Nebraska to get his wife back in exchange for a New York bus ticket, which I like how this actually works because he's just a kid in a Santa outfit. Yeah. Just when I think Santa Claus, I don't think of like 17 year old kid that doesn't even have facial hair yet. Also the fact that threw me that it's like, but that's like a quick four to six hour drive. 
I guess after the the wife situation, he must have just gotten a job at a different precinct entirely, or she went back home, or maybe I'm just trying to look for too much information on Max and Marjorie in this film. So they end up driving to the the Turf and Turf uh, diner that Marjorie works at, and she won't take Max back because of his infidelity at Smitty's. Um, so Jake talks to her about him not liking his stepmother and using kind of these examples, uh, which is clearly thinly veiled, just him um, about all these things. But instead, he convinces Max, you need to go in there and you need to sing your feelings in a song. And uh, it's this weirdly off key, sometimes horny, weird segment of this song. Oh, baby. I do like we're at the end. Jake tells Max, Now on your knees. Now on your knees. Then we don't sing it. Yeah, I like how it's scripted. And then, like, at the very end, he ditches the script and he goes from the heart. Yeah. And that's where I thought it was funnier on how he starts embellishing and adding in these things that are weird to us. But I guess match made in heaven for them. So good for them. So. Um, to their promise, uh, Max decides to get a bus ticket home to New York for Jake, where we then go back to Eddie's car for deep thoughts about skillet breakfasts and the Messiah. Um, as he's talking about how he has deep thoughts too, or he has ideas too, and he talks about how more things can't be served in a skillet, like Denny's. Think about it. They give you your meat, your eggs, your spuds right in the pan, man, that rocks. I, I don't have any pros or cons against Denny's that like I I'm neutral. I'm Switzerland in the Denny's discussion, I guess, but I don't know if I would use that as the, the comparison I want of why can't more restaurants just be like Denny's. And then the whole thing of essentially, what if God were one of us? What if the homeless guy that comes up to you saying he's a Messiah and you turn him down? What if he does turn out to be the Messiah? Think about it. Eddie, I think has moments where he's almost likable in how, dumb he can be but then they kind of keep throwing it away every so often which is disappointing because i think eddie's the one out of anybody in this movie that kind of gets shafted by the writing of he doesn't really have an arc he doesn't really have closure he just kind of is there you think he changes yeah kind of sort of and he just disappears well, it's a problem of the main character he's supposed to be likable but he's not and he's a scumbag through the whole movie so the only way that you can make a scumbag a more likable person is to make somebody worse, but I guess the the writers just didn't have the heart to do that to him. I don't know, like it. Yeah, to have him he be had like... that one redeeming scene where he was talking with Allie, and when she brought up like you know, like just the general deep question stuff kind of thing that like couples would talk about when they first start dating, sort of thing. But he thinks it's stupid, and then he goes off the rails with something else that's just equally deep, and then he you know, ruins it for himself. And the whole time I really feel that she's just too, I, I feel bad. Cause I feel in like five, 10 years time, she's going to wake up and realize like, Oh my God, this guy's terrible for me. Oh that's yeah. That's where the sequel will come in. And that's when I'll be home for Christmas, but it's actually, she's going over to Eddie's house instead. I mean, that's the chances <laughs> with most high school relationships. I think. Absolutely. I mean, power to you guys if you're listening and your high school sweethearts. Good for you, but that's the chance. That's that's uh, this kid's a literal walking red flag. It's it's amazing on how she's as smart as a girl as she is. I'm surprised she hasn't kind of realized that herself. I actually almost want them to do a like a Disney Plus sequel to this movie now because it's like for the most part, Jonathan Taylor Thomas and Jessica Biel look pretty much the same. It's not like they've really aged that much, to my knowledge. Yeah, Jessica Biel, yeah. Oh, no, she aged. I you, She definitely looks more girly. Well, less baby face. I mean, there's less of yeah, a baby she face. Definitely but... Has the... Yeah, but not like it's going to be like, I'll be home for Christmas 2 starring Crypt Keeper 1 and 2 kind of deal. Yeah. Dean, what do you keep posting here? Sound like, keep posting? I guess I can Don't tell it. me you don't say it at all. I, I will, I'm going to quit the podcast. <laughs> I think it's their cheekbones. Yeah, they're not they don't look exactly the same. It's the cheekbones and the eyes. Yeah. 
Dean won't let it die that Sean O'Brien looks like Patrick Wilson. So he's sending us comparison photos at to- in our Discord. At times. In real time. At times. <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't did premeditate these photos. Sorry. <laughs> In the background of his Discord video, you just see all of the photos on the wall on a corkboard. Uh, so yeah, so Eddie thinks deep thoughts about Skillet Breakfasts and the Messiah. Um, we cut back to Jake in a bathroom, just workshop and a couple hoes in front of a kid um, as he's trying to find out like what one works better, <laughs> which was a weird but kind of funny scene of the kid being like, well, the first one's good for really little kids like my sister, who's three. And the second one's good for big kids, like my friends and me. And the third one's good if you want to scare people and watch them run away screaming. Okay, cool, thanks. Whatever. And then there's no continuation of the scene. It cuts back to, um, like, the Eddie and Allie thing when they get to the, the Bavarian village and they decide to stay there and they're now they're having a little bit of fun and they're, like, throwing snowballs and chasing each other around and... Uh, Then accidentally just end up making out on live TV under a mistletoe um, while a reporter watches. And then (laughs) just as he's watching the TV. Yeah, as Jake is watching it and just seeing that in real time. So Jake decides to get on the bus and then he wants to go to this place um, because what was the name of the, the village? Edelbrook. So he wants to go to Edelbrook. The bus driver will not take them to Edelbrook. So he gets the idea that he's going to take the crayons from a little girl, the cooler from another guy, the meat sandwich from a third guy, just weirdly eating an open face sandwich with barbecue sauce that he's putting on with his fingers. A whole different thing going on there. So he ends up taking all that, uh, creating a fake organ donor cooler um, filled with what (laughs) is supposed to be a liver and then convinces the entire bus we need to go to Edelbrook because we need to get this to the the donor in time. Um, as you know, EMTs will write in crayon. On the <laughs> I was top just going to the- say, <laughs> they bought the crayon or the, just the crude writing. It's not even in like really good script. It's just like, now it's just, just scrawled in crayon on top of there. What's worse for me anyway is I watched Rat Race very around that same exact time. <laughs> And there is a scene in Rat Race where the whole point of the movie is to get to a specific location first. Whoever opens the container wins like a $3 million. And you're following like 15 different people trying to get to that spot. Rowan Atkinson is one of the people. And he gets picked up by Wayne Knight, who is transporting a human heart. And it's so much more official looking, just in the fact that it's... (laughs) It's crudely drawn crayon, and that's <laughs> in two different colors with ch- meat chuck inside. <laughs> just We've bear sitting that. on the ice, no bag, just just <laughs> laying inside. <laughs> just raw liver, just hanging. So yeah, he rallies the entire bus full of people uh, to bully the driver into stopping at Edelbrook. So he can try to get to Allie because Eddie and Allie are staying the night together because the honeymoon suite is the only thing still available. Uh, they sleep together in the same bed, just <laughs> far apart and Eddie in like double clothing and mittens. Jake ends up finally end up getting into the inn. He ends up first getting thrown out because he demands to have the location of where his girlfriend's staying and then accosts the woman behind the desk. This is when like, he was so close, and then I feel like the bus sequence is when it starts going downhill for him of he gets on the bus, but then he goes crazy and like ends up getting back off the bus, then losing the bus, then all this other stuff, that it's just go home and sort it out there. You could have saved yourself so much trouble, especially seeing as he actually ends up getting to Allie, and then the... So what gives with you kissing that slimy moron? It's not what you think. Jake, what are you doing here, bud? This love nest is full. Eddie comes out in a towel, and then he pulls Eddie's towel down. Yeah, that's another moment. Foul. Fighting foul. How could you let that idiot give you a ride? Dean, this is where the penises started. (laughs) I don't know. It was this movie right here. It wasn't hereditary. It was this. (laughs) Um, Is that discussion still in that episode? Because it's good. Great. Uh, (laughs) Um, Which I I think the the funny thing is 
Was that in the year in review rule of thirds or was that in the canceled shows rule of thirds? Because it's if it's in the year in review, this comes out before then. So all of you <laughs> listeners are going to hear some weird discussion and then you're going to listen to rule of thirds and you're going to be like, oh, that makes sense now. And you'll know it's true. And you'll know we record rule of one. thirds out of order sometimes. They, I mean, they didn't make any dick jokes or anything other than the fact that, oh, they just saw him. They just saw his dick. but then he covers up and like runs away yeah like there was no commentary on it or anything like that it was just like <gasps> boy it's was cold in here <laughs> yeah <laughs> if, they, if they made any kind of like an erect penis is what makes it explicit as long as it's flaccid it's okay to put on tv <laughs> if they were to make any mention of it then it immediately skyrockets to a rated r ra- uh um, rating or something i was gonna say you tack a dash 13 onto the rating at least oh yep. yeah so they block it with the orange juice, um, the glass with the orange juice in it. But instead of completely blocking it, it just like distorts it. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> it's still on camera. But uh, wait, is that that really that how it went? No, no, no. Oh, no. oh, oh. <laughs> that would be insane if Disney was just like, yeah, I mean, it's there, but it's not really anything anybody can enjoy. So he ends up having to run away. And then Allie ends up finding out because Jake accidentally mentions that i have to get there by six and she finds out that he never actually wanted to go to new york to bring her there for christmas he is doing it to get the porsche from his father uh so naturally she blows up on him and leaves him behind and takes his spot on the bus uh so now he is stuck in edelbrook with eddie brutal yeah because I was trying to remember of like, oh, so he gets off the bus and the bus leaves. And I'm like, oh, so the bus is still there. Ah, she takes his spot on the bus. So if he had just stayed on the bus, it would have taken him all the way to New York. He would have been a done deal. I know. Um, I know like there are dirty deeds being done, but dirty. like I feel like a high schooler being stranded with no money. It's, it's a really serious situation. <laughs> You're putting people in yeah. like. <laughs> Fuck you, you could stay here. I mean, I guess when she leaves, it's like, oh, Eddie has a car and maybe he'll take him home. But I don't know why she would have any reason to think that would be the case. But um, Eddie will take him home, even though Eddie hates his guts and knocked him out and dropped him in the desert to die and then find out that he didn't do the job. And that's what I was going to say earlier by skipping ahead. Like, yeah, maybe he wants that Porsche, I guess. But like, why would you get in? Why would you do anything with this kid like ever again? Or believe anything that he thinks he is well, offering I mean, to help you. If he has no money and the bus is gone, it's only game I guess. Down. Yeah, no, I guess that's that answers it. But yeah, so um, Eddie ends up taking him along and decides he's going to drive him to New York since he's going that way. And for a moment, like I kind of liked Eddie and Jake connecting because it immediately like she leaves him behind he's standing there and then it cuts to the two of them like i got roll the one i love is gone <laughs> i got roll <laughs> oh man i've seen guys get dumped before but that was nuclear i mean she wasn't even aiming at me and i'm gonna be walking funny for like a week how do girls do that i don't know it's like that whole chick verbal skills thing it's it's deadly <laughs> Oh, man. You know what? I got to tell you, bro. I would have never thought I'd ever help you out. But after that massacre, man, I just wouldn't be human. God, I never thought I'd be driving home with you either. It's pretty wild. Oh, it sure is. <laughs> and then Jake kind of confides in like, this is going to work out great. You know what? I'm I'm not worried if we can get there. I'll get the Porsche. Then I can get the girl back. And then that's when Eddie kind of realizes it and is like, wait a second. I'm helping you do all the things I don't want you to accomplish. Get out of my car. <laughs> not very smart. Not very yet. Right. I'm there. I I was rooting for him at that point. I was really proud that he put his foot down and like you're not good enough for Allie and did that. I thought that was awesome. <laughs> and then and he's come up jerks and, the wheel. And it's come up and it's like five minutes later devastates me because it's like seriously it he's like it's plus the fact that it's disappointing that Eddie didn't really cause any problems at the Bavarian place like he came out he just kind of made fun of Jake a bit or just kind of like talked him off kind of for a bit and then she decides to oh I was driving with Eddie nope I'm gonna leave both of them behind Eddie didn't really do anything to her so it's just why also decide yeah I'm not even gonna bother riding home with you the rest of the time even though we started having a good time on this um 
So she she did see him naked, so maybe she just couldn't handle that. <laughs> I cannot handle the rest of this ride knowing this. <laughs> I'm cursed with knowledge. <laughs> Her eyes are just like pure white. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a Fulci's the beyond. Um. So yeah, so she decides to take the bus. They're driving home. Eddie kicks him out of the car because he realizes like, I'm not going to help you achieve your goals Um. if it means it's all the stuff I didn't want you doing, which is unfortunate because I did. It would have been to me a a better arc. Like granted, we would have lost out on some of these sequences, but. If that's the case, shift some of these sequences earlier in the movie, have him get dropped later in the trip, and then this way it's Eddie helps get him to a certain point, or it's like, oh, the Eddie's car breaks down and he has to leave Eddie behind kind of deal. Because to have them end on this note, it's kind of disappointing of them to start becoming a little bit more friendly, or at least understanding where each other is coming from, and then just have them, nope, done, dropped delete everything we just did for the past like three minutes yeah i think it just the writers like you said just we need to have them separate and fuck eddie <laughs> yeah we just like, said this moment i thought it was so weird that eddie pulls a gun on him and he says get out of the car <laughs> open the car I, now jump as jtt i was like man i would have found a, i would have thrown something at his car as he left like i would have done so i couldn't have left that going unpunished put your thumbs in his eyes <laughs> <laughs> just escalates this zero Good luck three finding your way home eddie <laughs> well it only took three quarters of the movie but i think this is where he truly realizes his uh the error in his ways the grinch's heart anyway. grew three times yeah and then just like back to back to back you know like oh i'm gonna do it i'm gonna finally get home and he wins the stupid race. Uh, it, the whole race segment, I felt, could have, whatever. Anyway, uh, he wins the dumb race. He gets the money. And, of course, just as he's, like, heading to the airport to buy his ticket or just get out of there, that's when it's like, oh, yeah, the mayor is the one that always wins. And he always donates all the money and lays the massive guilt trip on JTT. So yeah, I think which that was the final straw. Yeah, I think the writers just felt they needed some sort of event or some sort of section of this to clearly show that he's changed as a person or that, like, there's more to him under all of this. So that was the whole sequence of he finds out the Santa 5K is going on to win a thousand bucks. He can't pay the entry fee. So this other guy, Jeff, pays it for him, um, which what was that throwaway Kenyan Santa line? Of just like, oh, we're going to be the ones who win here, um, except for maybe that guy. And it's just like a, another guy running by, and he just points to him. And he's like, Kenyon? Yes. All senses to the starting line. And he just keeps running. <laughs> and in a PG, like 1998 Disney film, I have no idea like <laughs> where that dropped in the script of them being like, this feels in place with all the rest of what we've laid out. Right. Um, that feels like a diff it's a different movies joke for sure. So yeah, this is. I mean, then again, it is the writers of like Deuce Bigelow and Without a Paddle, so this does make sense somewhat. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so I looked at the uh, when I was doing the um, the research for like the trip to get the map. It actually is supposed to be a Ferris Bueller type movie for a teen pilot kind of like pilot driven, however you put it. It was actually supposed to be for Ferris Bueller, and I felt that was like a a weird. I don't think they nailed it at all. No, I don't think no. he's Ferris Bueller esque. Um, no. I think that's why I was thinking enough. more Zach Morris is he is kind of indefensible um, for most of this, whereas I feel like Ferris Bueller at least is likable by people. It's not like a complete cad through and through. I mean, they have a whole funnier die series on uh, what was it, Zach Morris's trash of revisiting all of the horrible things that he does to his friends and all the people around him. So, yeah, so he ends up taking part in this 5K where he ends up getting towards the end. The other runner is going to win the uh, Kenyan Santa. And then he ends up like looking back to like make fun of them or like mean mug at them. And he ends up running into a sign and just knocking himself out. So the whole thing is you have to make it to the finish line with your hat and your beard. 
Jake gets towards there. Jeff is right beside him. He loses his hat. And I notice that Jeff stops running while Jake is trying to get his hat and get it back and then starts running once Jake starts running again, which is nice of he's at least trying to be as fair as possible because it's like he doesn't want to win if it means that he wins because the other kid had a mishap. Um, and then Jake blows him out at the end. Um, and he ends up losing anyway. So moral of the story is kick him while they're down. Get good scrub. So then it's actually the mayor's fault that he jeopardized those poor people's turkeys. Yeah. Can you imagine all the little kids like on the sidelines and whatnot and they see Jeff just stop running and they're like, Jeff, why? Why? <laughs> I you have to be, be fair. Again. But I'm hungry, Jeff. I have to be fair. <laughs> Lawful good. All their little legs sticking out to try to trip Jake in the last moments. So, yeah, so Jake ends up winning. He takes the $1,000, gets in a cab. He bounces. Uh, he's going to go to the airport and fly home. And the cab driver <laughs> drops the knowledge on him that, as Nick said, Oh, you didn't know? Well, he wins every year. A lot of us folks wish he'd won this year, too. Yeah, he seemed like a good guy. Keeps potholes filled, huh? Mm, yeah, he keeps the potholes filled. He also donates his entire winnings every year to buy turkeys for people who can't afford them. He had to be the man. To, to remain the mayor, he has to win 10 straight victories in the Santa <laughs> Run. <laughs> this was the 10th race. <laughs> After 10 races, we reclaim Toledo. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so he ends up uh, losing and deciding, you know what, he's going to give the money back to the mayor anyway. He's going to keep that tradition going, which I think this is the scene that even though it feels like just jammed into place, this is the scene that I think does show him showing his good side or trying to turn over a leaf a little bit of he ends up writing on the envelope like the the turkey tradition continues and he drops it in the, the mailbox and the mayor comes out and talks with him and says like, oh, we'll set a table or set a spot for you at the table. And he just, nope, got to go. I thought when he got to the mayor's house, he was going to find that like, the mayor had killed his family, like, in a rage. <laughs> or the cab driver pulls away, and then a block around the corner stops the car, says that he think he lost his hubcap, goes back to the mailbox, snags that $1,000 $1, envelope, and drives the kid away. I like that scenario. Yeah. Um, the, the end. I like all of those, really. I mean, I was more so waiting of when he ends up saying like, oh, I'm going to give all the money to the mayor. Here you go. Well, do you want me to set a place? No, I got a place to be. I'll see you later. Like, have a good one. And he gives all the money back to the mayor that then the cab driver was going to be like, you still owe me. <laughs> like, I'm not <laughs> I have free. Uh, five bucks. <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, we're at one destination. I'm still taking you to the airport. You will still need to pay me when you get there. Um if it's going to be like he's going to tuck and roll once they get to uh, <laughs> wherever the Madison airport is. Don't worry. I kept a hundo for you out of that uh, envelope. <laughs> so, yeah. So, Jake ends up calling home because he's kind of beaten down. Of He doesn't have the money anymore. He's not going to be able to get home. He tries to get a hold of his dad. He ends up talking to his sister, Tracy, instead. And Tracy lets him know she still has a lot of money stored up from a bunch of birthdays in her ballerina bag upstairs. And she can buy him a ticket. Damn, she's carrying this household. Yeah, like, <laughs> she she meet up with a kid from Blank Check. So she is, we're going to enter a section of the film that feels very weird as far as pre-9-11 air flight. Because we have, like, very few safety regulations other than just show me an ID. Um, a little girl bought a plane ticket by herself online, put a password on it. He just has to walk up and say the password. In the, I was just gonna say there were no reper repercussions for that, right? 
but I don't think we see him. And just a, a nope. man on a Santa let the coat. dog loose. And they're like, ah, oh, loose dog in the middle of the airport runway. Then they shot at the dog. <laughs> he just looks back and he winces and he's like, oh, but I did leave all that money to that guy. I didn't expect to see this movie on that website that tells you if the dog dies. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, he he escapes the plane um, after traveling via crate. He ends up taking a train and then gets kicked off the train because they ask for a ticket and they say, uh, no ticket, which to me, I've never encountered this before. But would they actually just stop the train midway and kick you off the train wherever you are? No, then you get um, you get sent off the next stop. Because if that's a case, they try to find you too. I don't know. I mean, he doesn't have ID. He doesn't have anything. Yeah, probably costs too much to try to roll him like a hobo. So yeah, yeah. like it's if that's the case, if they just kick him off at the next stop uh, because he doesn't have money, why couldn't he just daisy chain trains all the way to where he needed to go? Of just get on the next train and just yeah, be like, ticket, point. sorry, ticket, sorry. Um, the true until hobo. He, until eventually it's like a Emperor of the North. They're going to have like Ernest Borgnine come out with a wrench and just beat him if he doesn't have a ticket. <laughs> we heard about you. <laughs> <laughs> Watch that film, Emperor of the North. Ernest Borgnine is a train conductor who is known for beating hobos. Um, and Lee Marvin is like the king of the hobos, a number one. Um, who is fighting against him? Ernest Borgnine would like he'll put like a giant piece of metal on a chain and drop it underneath the train to knock off hobos who are holding. On. Jeez, here I am thinking of just Silent Bob and Dog Man just kicking the guy off the caboose like no ticket. Oh man, nope. I gotta, I gotta see that. Oh, uh, I think it was like late seventies <laughs> or mid seventies. Um, so yes, Emperor of the North. Uh, so yeah, so Jake gets kicked off the train. So he ends up jumping on the top of a car because nobody's going to let him hitchhike, and he rides it into Larchmont, where he then ends up seeing a parade, seeing a sleigh, and stealing the one horse open sleigh um, to ride it instead of to his house to Allie's because evidently she's nearby. At this point, I just accept it. Yeah. <laughs> just, just, okay, there's like thousand and one wrong things wrong with this entire thing, but I'll I just okay. <laughs> so yes, he ends up um riding it to Allie's to win her back because she said at one point, like, I wouldn't even take you back if you showed up at Christmas Eve with a one horse open sleigh. Alas, he shows up on Christmas Eve with a one horse open sleigh, and um against her word, she takes him back because he ends up Riding her, well, not, not riding, sorry, not riding her to his parents. I forgot how good you were in bed. I'll take you back, honey buns. <laughs> oh, I thought I thought it was like she lead, led the sleigh kind of thing. Oh, oh, like, oh. Allie, there's no way I'll make it back in time to get the Porsche with only one horse. I also need the power of you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, no, he rides with Allie um, back to his parents' house. And then just to make a point, after he scatters carolers twice, just to make a point, he ends up getting there and then... What time is it? It's 5.59. You made it. Yeah, I guess I did. Tell me when it's after six, okay? What do you mean? Aren't you going in? No, not yet. But I thought... Just so she's aware, like, so I'm not doing this anymore to win the Porsche. I don't care if I win the Porsche. Like, granted, yes, I'm here in time. I want to lose. It's more important to me that we're here. Great. Congratulations, Jake. Yeah, he knows how much his dad's a stickler for exact timing. (laughs) This was the final straw where I'm like, you know what? I'll allow it. I'll allow it. And it's like, well, wait one more minute. Bullshit. Like, a minute is going to matter. Your dad knows if you came in five minutes late, he's still going to give you the fucking Porsche. He shouldn't have even given you the Porsche to begin with. And that was a spoiled move that he was offered the Porsche even to come home. So the fact that this snide kid is like, I'm going to wait one more minute just to win you over and prove a point, knowing his dad is going to give him the Porsche. I feel like all of that that he's done up to this point where he's supposed to be turning the tide. This is where I'm like that little scumbag. He knew what he was doing. (laughs) I mean, what if it was a case of his dad never intended to give him the Porsche and then he gets there and he's like, 
I guess I get the Porsche. And his dad was like, I never said that. And it's like, do you, do you have it in writing? Do you have a witness? And then well, he ends when up. You have a pristine Porsche sitting on your driveway. No, that's where I start. That's where I started parking it. Just, just today. His son takes him to court over it because he thinks he owns the Porsche. <laughs> and then his dad buries him in paper until next Christmas. Um, so yeah, so he ends up getting there. He says, no, let's wait a minute. Let's just watch my family. And then we'll go in because it was just after six. His family was just getting ready to sit down for dinner. They decide, okay, now's the time to go in. I guess that horse just lives there now outside. Um, they end up meeting the the family. He ends up talking with Carolyn, the stepmother that um, he always had issues with because he felt it wasn't right that his father remarried so quickly 10 months later. Um, but he ends up showing a, a friendly side to Carolyn. They get together. He then talks to his dad and his dad's like, hey, I get it. Here, you can still have the Porsche. And he turns it down only because he says like, now I still want to come home and work with you on this thing. Like, I I'm not going to take the car. Bullshit. Because Allie was in the room. Oh, I yeah. like when they the second she uses the bathroom, like, Dad, come on, give me the give me the keys. It was weird when they first pull up and he's like, I'm not gonna go inside and he's like trying to motion to her with his eyes, like, Look, there's my family, like, let's just watch them and then his eyes like gloss over like white and he's just his his jaws like open, just staring at his family. <laughs> I didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> Starts absorbing their energy. <laughs> um They just start yeah. they just start turning into <laughs> <laughs> it's like the last crusade they're just withering away <laughs> or what if it's like wait hold up let me know when it's just after six let's watch my family and then you hear the the gongs go off for six and then the house blows out <laughs> just watch watch what my family I guess it's about time I went home for Christmas. Care to join me? You bet. <laughs> well, now I'm not going to just get the Porsche. I'm going to get the life insurance. I'm going to get the policy. I'm going to get the estate. Good thing Dad Stay with me, Allie. when I asked him to take out the car. <laughs> it's all for you, Allie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you find out Eddie didn't get left behind. He got there ahead of time, and he's the one who rigged the explosives. That's what they were deciding in the car. <laughs> we need an alibi. We can't show up together. You get arrested. Um, I'll go off of my myself. Eddie, you still work with dynamite? <laughs> Eddie, have you ever seen strangers on a train? <laughs> no? Have you ever seen throwing mama from the train? Okay, good. Let's hear what we're going to do. <laughs> so, yeah. So, he ends up going in the whole conversation. He gets turned down of, I don't want the, the car. Um, and then they have the parade coming into town. And he says, oh, there's my parade. So we're going to go out and a parade finds Jake. They then find the sleigh and realize that it's the kid who stole their sleigh. And an entire parade of people get ready to kick his ass, um, but decide to let him off the hook for some reason. <laughs> it's Christmas. <laughs> and then at this point, I was like, oh, OK, so good. So now the parade's there. The parade gets the horse and carriage back. So they take the sleigh because otherwise it's like, what? It, how are they going to handle this sleigh situation? But nope. They hop in the sleigh and they're like, okay, let's go. So the parade is just kind of cool with them going on a sleigh ride with their sleigh that they just never get back um, this evening. Also, the fact that the big thing was get here by six because your stepmother worked so hard on dinner. Yeah. And just dinner is just on the table. It. and They just all left. So all the stepmother really wanted was a fucking a, a sweatshirt. Yeah. Was there orange juice on the table? Was it drunk? That's usually all that's consumed. <laughs> <laughs> gotta go i'm late Just six spots at the table with toast one bite taken out so yes so that is i'll be home for christmas uh they all live happily ever after except eddie who is in lockup i guess who at some point probably by the way up. like can you that seems pretty abusive uh abuse of power all you said was like hey get out of the way you dummies and then they arrested him yeah, so, yeah, the whole thing with Eddie getting arrested is while the race was going on, he was stuck at one of the, like, 
you can't cross kind of things that they sometimes put up to block roads for the races. And he saw two people like as trees there. And he was like, hey, move it. And they turned around and they found out they were cops. And the next thing we know, his car is getting towed and he's in lockup in the back of the car, like screaming for Jake. Um, so <laughs> no, um, my head candid no. is, is like they were going, they were going to like you know, license registration. And then he's like, sir, there's or like officers, there's really nothing to do. Like, look, I need to go. And he's getting out of the car while they're yelling at him to like get back in the car. He's ignoring it. <laughs> Just saying on how, and he's reciting the entire journey of what led him to this exact moment and why he was upset. The cops are like holding their arm out while they're reaching for their gun, like, sir, please, you need to remain in your vehicle. And he keeps pursuing forward, and then just some big thing happens, and he gets slammed onto the ground, and that's why he gets arrested. And they Stop start resisting. firing, and he's still walking forward as Eddie is just getting torn apart, but he's still talking. His eyes go white. He's still it's like continuing. It's like Wolverine. <laughs> I'll just heal. Um so yeah, so that that's <laughs> that's that. Um I still like the movie from back when I used to um when I saw it last ages ago. I think there's definitely faults in this thing, but I think as far as like a very cheesy Walt Disney production 90s comedy, I I think it's pretty solid. I think this falls right with things like a, all the other stuff they had around this time, like Jungle to Jungle or all this other. I won't put it in the rotation. Bad. I won't think it's a. I don't think it's a bad movie, but I think there's so many other Christmas movies that I'm like, I don't oh, need. Yeah. I don't need to add this to yeah. uh, to a yearly list. It, it reminded me a lot of The Little Mermaid, in where and as a kid <laughs> watching The Little Mermaid, you side with Ariel. And oh, it, okay. Tim. No, I thought you were going to go plot wise. <laughs> let me like, finish. Wait, no. <laughs> Let me finish. I I I close my eyes and I immediately can just imagine what Little Mermaid. Hold on, I did the it same makes thing. Sense. So yeah, it's just Little Mermaid. You side with Ariel through the whole thing as a kid. It's like you know you want to break free from your parents' rule. You know kids kind of can side with that. And then flash forward as an adult, you rewatch the same movie and you're no longer siding with Ariel. You're like, why the hell is this you know bratty teenage girl trying to endanger herself? Her father makes so much sense but as a kid you don't see that and i can kind of see the same thing going with this movie where as a kid in that same exact appropriate time frame of like when we should be watching this as you know younger selves jonathan taylor thomas seems a lot more likable but now it's like he's a walking red flag i've said it three times already but seriously he's got so many times where uh, jessica beale had every opportunity to walk and she really needs to but i only see that as an adult as a kid of his age i wouldn't see that and i would just see it as just the womp the romping adventure that they're currently on now yeah yeah i guess that doesn't really it doesn't really say that he will change his ways it's like okay he's he does have good in him but it's not like saying that he's not going to be scheming and just still doing all this random shit yeah that could just, cause issues is given to him on a silver platter and i really don't feel that he's going to change anything yeah. he doesn't have a reason to really. so yeah like he might treat his family better but i doubt he's going to go back and be like i'm no longer going to run schemes on all the other kids at school <laughs> or like any of that stuff it's like no he's doing yeah because there's no there's no return to home. that there's no like uh callback to that kind of part of his life the end of the movie should have been him making one phone call to ian and he's like ian burn it all down and ian's just like dumping gasoline on all of their computers and all of their files well he can't he's probably still in the locker i was just gonna say it should have ended with him being wheeled out of the school like this kid was oh, found in the locker <laughs> god because they ended up <laughs> when they threw him out in the desert everybody went home for break yeah nobody knew ian was there so ian so is there the man dudes are still they killed <laughs> one person instead of two yeah because that means like Unless somebody found him that night, school's done, everybody's gone the next day, and they don't return until after New Year's. Yeah, Ian's fucked. <laughs> and that's how you sneak a murder into a PG uh, PG movie. Negligence. It just cuts outside the lo locker, and it's just dark, and you just hear Ian like, man, I hate drinking my own urine. <laughs> <laughs> or do I? <laughs> Oh, oh. 
So <laughs> God. Oh, boy. that's the movie. Um, I don't know. Do you guys have any final thoughts on I'll Be Home for Christmas before we put a bow on this? I would have eaten at Turf and Turf. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. 100%. That seemed like a fun place. I would have loved that place. I would have gone to Cabo alone and just seen who I could meet down there. And just scheme? <laughs> scheme my way through Cabo. It's like a dirty, rotten scoundrel situation going on down there. Um, so, yeah. So, I'll be home for Christmas. Maybe not the Christmas staple in everybody's catalog, but I think it's certainly better than it's given credit for at least from nowadays like it's it's not a seven it's not an eight but i think it's it's a 5.5 it's a six so maybe next year whoever's pick it is we'll have maybe we'll do die hard or a christmas classic Um, i I still have one magic christmas the christmas star and muppet christmas carol in my my weapons bag there so we'll. i've never chosen a christmas movie nobody's ever let me i know um, and with the rotation, that means I won't get through all of my Christmas movies for at least another <laughs> like nine to ten seasons. Because <laughs> that means I have to wait three years for another my movie for Christmas. Um, and if I have three of them, it's going to be a long time. So we could trade slots, maybe like cards. You know what I mean? We could bargain. We'll do the draft. And you could, if if I get picked for next year, you can take mine. Because it'll probably be just Batman Returns, because I don't have any others after Christmas Vacation. Die Hard? No. Oh. Die Hard was an adult movie for me, not a childhood one. Really? Huh. Die Hard was an interesting movie as a child, because I saw it on TV all the time, and my family liked it, because they like showed me, of like, oh, you'd like Die Hard. And then we were like at Best Buy, and we saw the, whatever it was, like the, the, steel book for die hard the first one or something and we bought it and then it was oh there is a lot more in this film that does not make the tv edit and then my family was like oh, clutch my pearls all this language so next year or not thank you again for coming along for the adventure on i'll be home for christmas as always you can find us on twitter not really facebook instagram at screen refresh or email us your own movie memories at screen refresh at gmail.com if you like the show, help us out and leave a rating review on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts to help others find us. If you like horror, check us out on our other show from the Screen Refresh Network called Don't Open This Podcast every second and fourth Monday with myself and my co-host Mike Felsigno. For Nick and Dean, I'm Tim. It's been fun and we'll see you again in a couple weeks on Rule of Thirds. <laughs>